ahead and get started here. Thanks everybody for joining uh, for our, our first lunch and learn of the season on high efficiency heat recovery. Uh, thanks to Dylan Agnes, who's on the line, and he's going to be kind of managing our IT. Uh, so if you've got any questions of audio or visual breaking up during this presentation, um, just send questions to Dylan and he can let me know. Um, otherwise, I will leave time at the end for questions, um, but it's a little bit too much for my brain to uh, handle chat while also doing uh, Zoom and presentations. Normally, I'd love to field your questions live, but COVID, Zoom, this is where we are right now. Um, so this is an open lunch and learn, and just feel free to type in questions on the content as we go along, um, as if you could raise your hand and ask it in real time. And at the end of the presentation, I'll address it. Uh, so I think that's some of the, the logistics out of the way. Um, since it is first of the season, um, I can give you an intro to who we are and what we do if you aren't already familiar. Hopefully you are. So Integrated Design Lab, we're a research branch of the University of Idaho's Art and Architecture. Uh, I am honored and, and grateful to take over as director uh, from Ken, who will be working on building his house up in Idaho City uh, later this summer. Uh, and, and we've got a great team of grad students here. Uh, we'll, we'll be bringing on hopefully uh, another one uh, this summer. And we're really focused on technical support for uh, energy efficient buildings that really serve the occupants. Idaho Power supports us in a lot of this work. One of those ways is uh, by supporting this Lunch and Learn program, uh, giving us the chance to, uh, you know, engage with emerging technologies and, and what's what's coming into market. We also do technical design assistance on individual projects. So if you uh, have some basic questions about uh, new technology or energy efficiency recommendations, go ahead and give us a call. We, we are literally paid to answer your questions on those subjects. Uh, and, and we'd love to field those inquiries or help with say a, a walkthrough or an energy audit. Uh, up to $4,000 worth of our time can be covered under phase two. Um, once again, Idaho Power is paying all of that. So it's a free service to you to really enhance the energy efficiency of your design, where we can do some basic simulation and, and things like that. We do need to fill out, um, you know, a, a form and seek approval for that. Um, but Idaho Power is great. They, they get back to us usually within 24 hours. Um, Although it, it does say allow one week for approval, um, it's it's usually a quick turnaround and, and we can start helping you right away. For a very large project, we've got one going on right now uh, near Haley, Idaho. Uh, we can do really in-depth analysis and simulation all the way from the beginning of design up, up through construction um, and offer some, some detailed recommendations and report on that. In that case, Idaho Power will uh, engage in a cost share. So 75% is going to be covered by Idaho Power, 25% by the client. Um, and these are, are really to, you know, train uh, your, it, you, um, individuals, industry professionals, so that we're um, teaching you how to fish, so to speak. Uh, so you can take our recommendations, see the process that we go through, and we'll teach you how to do it. Um, so that you can do it in the future and, and just bypass us and just incorporate efficiency into your design from now on. That's that's our goal, uh, a more efficient Idaho. Uh, towards that end, Idaho Power also sponsors the Building Simulation Users Group. So BSUG, it's a free lecture series, uh, somewhat similar to, to ASHRAE, but focused really on energy efficiency and modeling for that. We've got a couple really good ones coming up. Uh, I'm excited to hear from Carlos next week. He and I were, were buddies who went to school together here. Um, he is going to show uh, simulation studies on how to use cooling towers for radiant systems. And basically at, at what point can you no longer use a cooling tower? Showing tools how to do that and, and avoid using chillers for uh, radiant systems, which is very applicable here uh, in, a, in a dry climate, but it still gets warm. Uh, then we've got uh, Ian Malloy uh, from Revit, who's gonna give an overview of Insight and some uh, new things coming in, in there. 
In terms of a joint session with ASHRAE, we're still working that out. We might not fit into the technical conference in May. That might be something for uh, next season coming up this fall. But um, we'll, we'll keep you up to date on that. We've also got our energy resource library. Uh, it's, it's a great library of tools that just like a Boise Public Library, you can check out um, and use on your projects. So flow meters, light, thermal cameras. Uh, we've really been updating uh, these tools as well as user manuals. So you can come in, uh, we can do no contact pickups on those things. Um, for, uh, and we've also got kits for like indoor air quality, uh, monitoring boiler operation, all sorts of good things. And I'll talk about those um, in, uh, in more detail later. Idaho Power, um, Shri and Chris Paulo, I saw that you were on here. Um, feel free to interrupt me and, and talk on these if you want. Uh, but uh, they have a wonderful commercial and industrial energy efficiency program. Uh, please refer to the website, um, you know, idahopower.com slash business for more details on um, both the prescriptive and custom projects that they allow. Uh, so, um, sorry, managing my screens here a little bit. Um, you know, major renovations, additions, expansions. So uh, a warehouse converting to a brewery uh, or adding a load to a space. Uh, they also offer incentives for reducing load during peak of summer uh, and free energy saving kits for businesses. So um, yeah, don't, don't, don't leave that money on the table. Um, get, it, get it back to your clients and let's all save energy. Uh, that's, that's true for both new construction and major renovations. There's going to be a new program rollout I see on June 1st. Um, and don't forget about, you know, the technical assistance incentive, uh, that is up to $5,000 per project. Um, and that's, that's separate from the, the technical design assistance that IDL does. So feel free to take so advantage. Damon? Yeah, Shree, thanks. This, this is Shree. Do you mind if I pipe in real quick on this slide? Me too. I just wanted to let you guys know that our new construction energy efficiency incentive program, as well as our retrofit program, will have a new program rollout June 1st, 2021. Um, that new program is going to add some measures. It's going to remove some measures. It's going to expand on a few measures. So there are quite a few changes happening on June 1st. So if you've got a project in construction now or that you haven't turned in a pre-application or one that's coming up and you're concerned about that, you can always turn in a pre-application now and get yourself grandfathered into that program. Or give me a call and I can talk through kind of some of the changes we're looking at and see if it makes sense for you to wait until that June 1st rollout. Um, also just wanted to remind you about the professional assistance incentive that we have for a limited time doubled. It's through September 23rd, so it's projects that are completed as in finalized and paid by September 23rd. And what we did was we doubled that incentive that goes to architects or engineers that help the owner with the paperwork. So that's equal to 20% of the equal to 20% of the owner's incentive up to $5,000 per project. Does not take away from the owner's incentive. That is through September 23rd. We are hoping to expand it further beyond that, but I can't guarantee this at that time. So if you've got some projects that are completed and you're looking at getting those paperwork, the only way I can get guarantee that doubled professional assistance incentive is if they're into me by September 23rd. Again, I'm hoping to continue that and keep that, but I can't guarantee that. And if anybody's got any questions, feel free to, I'm paying attention to the chat. You can send me a chat or feel free to call me as well or email me. Thank you very much, Shree. Sounds like, sounds like a great program. All right, well, I think that's, that's all the front matter that we've got. Um, the topic today is gonna be uh, hopefully helpful on, on design criteria and the effectiveness of high efficiency heat recovery. So there's a lot of crossover between this topic and dedicated outdoor air systems. I'm going to focus particularly on heat recovery during this. Um, and as I mentioned before, I'll leave some time at the end for questions, but feel free to uh, type them into the chat as we go and I'll, I'll see them at the end. All right, so ventilation is kind of on everyone's mind right now. It's, it's why we're doing an open lunch and learn over Zoom. 
because uh, we still need to get those vaccines out. Um, and we, we don't want to have a lot of recirculation of germs indoors. But that's something that we've lived with for a long time. And I'm kind of glad that it's getting attention now, uh, even though, you know, COVID is, is, is not ideal at, at any time. Uh, at, at least it's highlighting the need for um, proper ventilation uh, in buildings and creating healthy spaces for us all that will hopefully um, continue uh, long after this um, short, um, terrible pandemic. So in terms of how, how do we maximize good ventilation, uh, it's, it's pretty straightforward. ASHRAE has some great recommendations out there. Uh, Ken Baker is going to give a presentation more specific on this, on indoor air quality coming up. So keep your eye on, on our website and our calendar for that. But we want to increase outdoor air ventilation as much as possible, right? Um, just bring in that, that fresh air, that uh, sunlight does a, a great job of disinfecting uh, a lot of the, the nasties that would be floating out there. And we don't wanna recirculate uh, germs and dust and bioeffluence within spaces, the, the pig pen effect that uh, while it's very funny from the Charles Schultz cartoon, uh, is literally around us all the time. You know, we've, we've, we're constantly emitting um, smells and skin cells and virus particles, um, aerosols around us. So the less we recirculate that within our HVAC, the better. The other recommendation coming out of ASHRAE is to keep those systems, that, those ventilation systems running longer. So just more air through the building, especially more outdoor air. Um, and, and of course, there's there's some tension there in terms of energy efficiency, uh, which Kevin Van Den Weimellenberg has, has been addressing in, in some of his IBIPSA lectures and, and one of our uh, BSUGs that we had last year. So if we're increasing all that ventilation and there's going to be these consequences in terms of energy, how can we still get that air but lose as little heat as possible? and that's through heat recovery. So just some, some basics before we dive into the details. Um, you've got two main types of heat recovery. You've got your, your rotary wheels, that, that might be an enthalpy wheel, and you've got your uh, plate uh, heat exchangers. So you can get uh, cross flow or counter flow through those. So the idea is, you know, it's, it's very cold outside, maybe five degrees. Uh, whereas indoors, you're trying to keep it at a nice 70 degrees. As you're exhausting that return air, you are recycling the heat uh, so that your supply air is at a warmer temperature, you know, not as warm as the indoor air, but you try and recycle as much of that heat as possible while still keeping the air streams separate. In terms of code requirements, um, these heat recovery systems are, are required in certain projects. Which projects uh, really depends on the, the percentage of outdoor air that you're bringing into your design um, and the, the amount of total air. Uh, there's a table there. I, I won't bore you with that detail right now, but uh, it's, it's been increasingly stringent and, and updated over time. For that, the, the energy recovery ventilator uh, to be code compliant uh, when it's required by code must be 50% or greater. So you're, you're recapturing at least half of the heat that you are exhausting out of your building. It also has to include a bypass to allow economizer operation. And I'll talk about that um, more in detail shortly. When I talk about high efficiency heat recovery though, what, what exactly does that mean? It's gotta be better than code minimum, right? Better than that 50%. Uh, I'm going to rely heavily on uh, NIA, uh, Northwest Energy Efficiency Alliance's uh, criteria that they've developed. You can see more at betterbricks.com. Uh, they have a, a, a high efficiency qualification for heat exchangers at an 85% effectiveness that is uh, in terms of sensible heat recovery. So not looking at latent heat recovery, so no, no humidity, but just 85% sensible at the midpoint of nominal flow for that particular uh, equipment. So if you have a, a thousand CFM maximum, 
uh, HRV than at at least 500 uh, CFM at the design conditions, uh, you should be able to recover 85% of your heat. And the efficiency of any heat recovery ventilator kind of depends on its configuration, its, its type of flow. So if you're trying to put two airstreams in parallel that are flowing the same direction next to each other, the maximum effectiveness that you can actually achieve is only about 50%. Cross flow, which would be perpendicular airstreams to each other, you can get 50 to 70% maximum effectiveness. But if you're doing multiple pass flows, um, so say they're crossing um, uh, perpendicularly at one point, and then they reconvene again at a, at a second point, uh, you can get up to 85%, which is near that high efficiency criteria, but that's at, at the very top. Whereas counterflow, where you've got one airstream flowing one direction and one airflow in the opposite direction, uh, and hopefully a number of different veins. So um, you've got a, a lot of surface area contact between the two different streams. Um, those can be up to 99% theoretically effective based on um, you know, fundamentals of thermodynamics that, that you can see in your um, mechanical engineering reference manual, MERM, uh, or your ASHRAE fundamentals books. So we're, for high efficiency heat recovery, we're really looking at counter flow um, heat units. It's also important to note um, in terms of the effectiveness uh, to see what conditions those are being measured at um, in terms of the brochures. So if you look at um, the ASHRAE ANSI standard uh, in 2016, these are the design conditions that are required for them to report that efficiency. So winter outdoor temperature of 35 degrees, uh, indoor temperature of 67 degrees. So they should be reporting their um, efficiency based on uh, these temperature set points. And for summer, uh, you're looking at a 95 degree outdoor dry bulb temperature and an indoor dry bulb temperature of 75 degrees. So in Boise, that's fairly close to our design conditions in terms of summer. Uh, whereas winter, you know, we're probably gonna be stretching much, much colder than this. Um, and not all uh, ratings are, are created equal. So there can be differences in effective efficiency depending on if you're including that electric consumption to uh, rotate that wheel or, or run those fans, uh, and as well as accounting for the differences in mass flow rate. Uh, so don't just take basically the, the brochure number that you see as eta is equal to 85% and assume that you automatically have a high efficiency heat recovery unit. Uh, it, it takes a lot more kind of investigation to see whether it's meeting all of NIA's criteria uh, for a high efficiency heat recovery unit. And that's looking at um, how that efficiency changes with time uh, or, or pardon, with, with uh, CFM and with temperature. Um, so in, in heating mode, you can see we have you know, much better efficiency at lower flows as you're trying to force more and more air flow through there, your efficiency is, is dropping off. Uh, so that's why there's that criteria to look at the effectiveness at the midpoint of nominal flow. Passive house certification uh, out of uh, Darmstadt, Germany, uh, that they have some different testing protocols there, uh, not only for Germany, um, Switzerland and Austria also have different testing protocols in order for a heat recovery unit to be passive house certified. Uh, and that is much more precise than um, the HRI or ANSI standard that we usually test you in the States. So um, look for that passive house certification or see if it's on the NIA qualified uh, product council list to make sure that uh, the heat exchange rate is, is meeting that 85%. You also wanna make sure that you've got economizer control when you're specifying a unit. So this is using uh, fresh air 
when we can for uh, free cooling. You, you don't need to exchange heat if your building's in cooling mode. It makes no sense to try and warm up that outdoor air to bring it in only to cool it back down. Right, so you want to have some sort of bypass around that initial uh, exchange. You still need to filter it, uh, especially you know noting uh, some of the studies that have come out recently on on wildfire smoke and the effect that that has on us. Um, and and we're just installing um, higher MERV filters as well in, in terms of COVID. Um, but it's it's important that your unit um, isn't just locked into constantly uh, heat exchange mode all the time, but using using cool, fresh air when possible um, that can kind of bypass it. In terms of controls, uh, you want to make sure that your unit can actually, uh, is, is, is smart, you know, not necessarily Internet of Things smart, but that you aren't bringing in tons of fresh air to an empty conference room. Uh, or when the building is unoccupied during non-COVID times, uh, as well as, as looking at, you know, varying it depending on, on capacity and temperature. Uh, I'll talk about zoning and some of those other things uh, later on in the presentation. The other piece of high efficiency is making sure you are, are limiting the thermal bridging as well as the leakage rate that might happen from one airstream to the other. Uh, with plate heat exchangers, leakage is much less of an issue than, say, an old style kind of rotary unit where you do happen to get a little bit of crossover from your exhaust stream into your supply stream. So um, that's, we, we really don't want that, especially during COVID times. Um, you know, we're, we're really trying to limit as, as much recirculation as possible. Uh, you're also just losing some of your, your heat recovery capacity by having any leakage within the system. Unless we need to force the air through these as well, right? So um, having a, a super effective heat exchanger with a, a really inefficient fan doesn't make a lot of sense. You're just burning up extra energy. So there are specific motor requirements on fan effectiveness that NIA provides as well. So looking at a, a fan that can provide 1.4 CFM at one watt or uh, 0.71 watts per CFM at half an inch uh, water column pressure. All right, so those are, are some kind of basic overview of what I mean when I say high efficiency heat recovery. Um, and, and there's a link here um, and we'll, we'll have the slides posted on our website um, later. Uh, so feel free to capture the link now or, or from our website and, and message me if you want. Um, but it's very important that we are actually achieving this efficiency because just having any old HRV uh, is not necessarily going to cut it. And there's a lot of savings to be had by looking at these high efficiency systems. When we say high efficiency, people usually I'll speak personally, I usually feel like, oh no, that's gonna be expensive. Like that's great for the people that are going lead platinum or net zero, but does that, do we really need high efficiency in your run of the mill small commercial? Uh, yes, actually, it, this is actually less expensive to use one of these systems than a uh, than basically a low tier uh, dedicated outdoor air system with lower efficiency. And we'll get into the reasons for that shortly. But let's let's look at the psychometrics of this. Um, I've got a couple of grad students in here right now uh, who are taking uh, Ralph Ludwig's HVAC class, um, so they're very familiar with these. Um, so sorry, sorry to give you, um, you know, traumatize you after you just had midterms and should be on spring break. But here we go again with um, psychometric charts. So if we look at Seattle winters design conditions. Uh, we're looking at a design day uh, of 25 degree outdoor air um, and an indoor condition where we're trying to maintain about 72 degrees and 35% relative humidity. Looking at a, a conventional HRV code minimum, that's, that's recapturing 50%. Um, and, and I've got um, 
you know, no, no humidity added here. Um, that gets us to uh, outdoor supply temperature of, you know, a little below 50 degrees, maybe 48 degrees or so. If we look at an HRV at 85%, so one of these high efficiency units, once again, that's 85% at, at mid flow. So maybe we're not quite reaching there, but we're still at a supply temperature of 65 degrees. That might be within the comfort level um, of our supply temperature if we've got indoor terminal units uh, that can then condition that mixed air. You know, you don't wanna be dropping in 48 degree air directly on somebody at their desk. Um, that's not gonna make them very happy. 65 degree air, while not super pleasant during the winter, is, is tolerable. Um, we, we can handle that, which means we might not need all those extra controls and all that extra reheat on that outdoor supply. Looking at summer conditions in Seattle, uh, my biggest takeaway here was Seattle summers are, are really nice. Um, there's, there's not a lot that, that we need to do to really uh, drop down the temperature, but a 50% effectiveness uh, will uh, allow us to come down from an 85 degree day to an 80 degree day. Whereas an 85% effectiveness is getting us almost to our indoor conditions as they are, um, which, which is gonna be very easy on the terminal equipment and um, you know, isn't, isn't gonna, we're, we're not asking a lot of the system in this situation. So saving a lot on cooling, which is wonderful. All right, let's look at Boise, which has um, uh, warmer summers, warmer, drier summers. Um, so here I was looking at the design conditions, um, at, which was about 97 or so, uh, dry bulb temperature, um, about 10% or so relative humidity. Using an HRV of 50%, uh, we can bring that down to say 87 degrees, but we still might get some say stratification issues within the building of this warm air that's sitting up above. Whereas if we use a, a higher efficiency system, 85%, uh, we're, we're looking at um, you know, a 77 degree or so um, supply temperature just for, for our fresh air, which we're then you know, conditioning cooler with our terminal equipment. Winters are a slightly different story. Um, and, and sorry that this one's a little, a little bit zoomed out. Um, so our, our design day condition that I chose, I think this was the 99% um, conditions here, uh, looking at about 10.5 degrees at close to 100% humidity. Uh, and 50% uh, HRV, it, it does us a lot of good. You know, it gets us up to 40 degrees but an 85% HRV will get us all the way up to 60 degrees. So that's, that's a 20 degree difference, uh, 20 degree Fahrenheit difference in terms of uh, what the terminal units would have to handle with this versus here. So um, our, our equipment has, has a much lower lift, uh, thermodynamically speaking, we can get much higher coefficients of performance if all we have to do is condition 60 degree air up to 72 degree air as opposed to conditioning 40 degree air up there. Um, 60 degree air, that's still gonna drop us down a bit too low, probably for direct supply. So there might need to be um, some supplemental heating on that, but a whole lot less than if we were relying on electric resistance uh, at, for an HRV at 50% or more. One thing I, I would like to note uh, is that uh, the design conditions for Boise have been changing over time. Um, I, I think there's, you know, strong scientific agreement on uh, global warming, but we also, I think more importantly in Boise have the, the urban heat island effect. And it, these are just based on ASHRAE's uh, design day conditions. You can look them up at um, ASHRAE Met, I think is the website. Uh, just Google it and you, you'll be able to find it. But make sure that you're using up to date design conditions. Because if we look at um, the 2009, 99.6% uh, winter condition, it was down at 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit, made a pretty big jump in 2013 up to 8.7. Now our coldest temperatures are around 9.4 for 
for you know all but 100 hours out of the year. Same for the 99% conditions, we've jumped from 10 all the way up to 15.9. So that's a six degree temperature difference over time. And if you're not factoring that into uh, your, your, your sizing calculations, uh, I, I think it's, it's time to update your software to make sure that you are, or at least double check, um, because it's certainly getting a lot warmer down here. Um, thankfully, we, we had a snowy winter, but you, I mean, it's, it's plain to all of us that Bogus has been struggling over time. Um, and for me, my rosemary continues coming back every year, whereas it used to die of frost from time to time. So, um, I, I did mention that we don't want to drop straight, um, you know, 60 degree air uh, on people uh, or, or 50 degree air when we're um, providing, you know, this, um, you know, direct ventilation, you know, the, the dedicated outdoor air. There is a wonderful resource, um, an ASHRAE design guide for dedicated outdoor air systems. Uh, that's another book that's within our tool loan library that you can check out anytime. It's, it's a fairly short manual, uh, really good stuff in there though, um, highly recommend. And what they actually advocate is uh, as you add in um, the supplemental heating on your outdoor air supply, if say your HRV can't keep up with those particularly cold days, um, as the outdoor air drops, uh, actually start heating up your supply air more than you would uh, if it's just mild outside. Uh, this gets into one of my favorite subjects, the, the idea of thermal comfort and the impact on building surface temperatures and how much we're impacted by those. But if it's mildly cool outside, maybe sweater weather, if you will, uh, you can get away with a much lower uh, discharge dry bulb temperature. But when it's getting particularly chilly out, when you definitely need a jacket, when it's, it's ski season, um, that's the time to ramp up your electric resistance or um, you know, heat pump supplemental heating on your outdoor air supply to say 67 degrees. Uh, so a little counterintuitive in terms of energy savings of we're heating it up more as it's getting colder out, but in terms of comfort, that's going to make a big difference. Uh, there's more details on that and more on control sequences uh, within this design guide, which, which like I said, I'd, I'd recommend and, and you can check out from our lab. Uh, you know, I, I think we're all on the same page, to, but just to double check that the difference here is that we're not recycling any air um, where we've got our return air turning into mixed air with some outdoor air. We're really trying to emphasize dedicated outdoor air systems with these high efficiency heat recovery systems. And the, the goal is to really try and, and remove germs and nasty sneezes um, as opposed to just recirculating them. And while there's still debate, scientific inquiry happening right now, where we're watching it, um, research happen in, in real time in terms of the length at which uh, COVID particles are still viable after they leave a human and are they then, you know, coming back into the system uh, if we're using a lower MER filter or not. Um, even, even if not, even if uh, by the time it, it reaches the, the recirculation stage, a lot of the, the virus is basically dried up and the RNA is no longer viable, you know, CO2 doesn't go away. Um, that, that CO2 gets recycled. Uh, Elizabeth uh, Cooper, who uh, was the previous director prior to Ken, I'm very grateful for her mentorship. She's currently doing her PhD uh, at University College London uh, and shared with me last week a publication she had in the Charter of International Building. Oh boy, I'm gonna mess it up. The CIBSE journal um, about CO2 levels in people's homes uh, before quarantine and after quarantine. A couple of surprising things that came out of there. One, people are using their windows less often 
not more. Maybe they're trying to keep down street noise and Jimmy and Johnny yelling at each other, you know, riding their bikes while everybody else is uh, trying to do a Zoom meeting uh, or, or listening to a lunch and learn, if you will. Anyway, windows are going up less often. So um, houses have been more enclosed and these apply to multifamily flats as well. Uh, and CO2 levels have been significantly rising because there are more people inside more of the time. Uh, and, and while, you know, we're kind of this, this particular talk is focused on commercial buildings, I think it's important to note that CO2 is uh, it's kind of a, a barometer that we use for, for the health of um, our, our building in terms of are we removing contaminants or are we just recirculating things? Um, and dedicated outdoor air systems really help on, on the removal. Uh, and I think it's a key design to make sure we're actually getting the airflow supply in there and the airflow removal that we, we design for. Because there's a lot of benefits to ventilation. Um, it, it really improves decision making uh, for, for school kids as well as adults. It, it increases the speed at which we can complete tasks. Uh, and really decreases absences by illness um, by, you know, a, a measurable percentage. 3% might seem small, but for a large company over a year, uh, those sick days really add up. And it's something we're, we're particularly aware of now during COVID. Uh, I also just finished a, a fascinating book I'd highly recommend called Breath by James Nestor. Uh, just talking about the impact that our, our breathing and our oxygen content levels have on our um, decision making abilities, our heart rates, um, all sorts of things. So our buildings really should be designed for good ventilation. Uh, and I, I think we're all on board with that. Uh, the, the sticky point is, of course, how much is this going to cost? Uh, so let's let's spend some time looking at some of the economics. So capital cost of a very high efficiency dedicated outdoor air system really depends on the type of project. Uh, there's some great reporting done by Redcart Analytics that was sponsored by NIA as part of their pilot program. It varied anywhere from $16 per square foot to $30 per square foot, depending on if this was going into a school or a restaurant or a dormitory. Um, but on average, they found a roughly 20% premium over a baseline system. So a 20% premium in terms of capital costs, but annual energy savings of 30 to 40%. And that was building wide, not just looking at uh, HVAC energy savings. So really, really significant savings. Um, you know, the, the biggest pieces of the pie in terms of building energy usage are heating, cooling and ventilating, right? Um, that, that's nearly half to a third, depending on if you're looking at commercial or, or multifamily projects. So uh, if we can really target that in terms of our energy savings, uh, it's, it's, there's, there's a lot of payback there. And high efficiency heat recovery ends up leading to smaller terminal units, uh, smaller equipment within the space itself. And this really leads to um, significant savings. So uh, once again, this is from that uh, red car analytics report. The, the link is here. Uh, but if you're looking at a baseline system, uh, they, they break down the HVAC cost uh, by uh, duct, by system, um, by um, extra design premium that's required to switch to a new system. And if you're looking at a, a low tier or uh, basically a, a baseline dedicated outdoor air system, VRF, uh, where you're using just a 50% effective HRV. Uh, it's gonna be a more complicated system, uh, especially if it's in Seattle where, where reheat is required. Um, and it's going to lead to more terminal units and um, higher costs. Mid-tier, uh, your premium comes down and your premium comes down the most looking at a very high efficiency dedicated outdoor air system. Uh, so it's, it's really important to make sure that you are um, sizing your system correctly, uh, looking at not just that nameplate efficiency that's on there, um, but really checking for that um, product certification at different levels of flow 
uh, at the appropriate design day conditions um, that are up to date to make sure that you are not oversizing your system and giving the client a premium over a baseline that they can't necessarily afford or isn't reasonable. Um, you know, as, as you downsize these systems, hopefully they are operating truer to their capacity and there's less cycling going on. The other savings that um, I think are important that, that I didn't necessarily consider until diving into this more is your filter savings. I think people are, are very keen to make sure they've got MERV 13 or higher filters right now in terms of COVID, maybe less of an impact if you're using, um, you're, you're not recirculating, but still in terms of wildfire smoke or uh, other, other pollutants out there, uh, if you're sitting next to a car park or a roadway, um, it's important to continue to change those filters. And if your filter area is as much smaller as it should be with a dedicated outdoor air system, or we're, we're using less air to condition the building, we're, we're transferring that conditioning over to the terminal units, um, then your, your filter cost and size and replacement over time uh, is and going to actually add up fairly significantly into the hundreds, if not thousands of dollars, depending on the size of the project. And this is coming out of the, the ASHRAE design guide. All right, um, so let's look at a, a theoretical case study. What does this look like for uh, a small uh, mid-rise office building uh, in Boise, climate zone five, uh, where we've got relatively inexpensive uh, energy costs and annual energy savings of, of 43 cents per square foot. Um, for this kind of theoretical example, when I when I plugged in the numbers, we're looking at an in initial premium of $171,000 during design, but an annual energy savings of $25,000. So um, your your return on investment occurs by year seven, and by year 20, you're you're looking at you know $200,000 worth of savings uh, for a system that should have a lifespan of 25 to 30 years, hopefully. Um, while not every client is set up to be the one paying their bills over time, if you've got a municipal or educational client, they certainly will. Um, and I think it's important to share this information with them uh, during the design phase and uh, during kind of that, that value engineering phase, if you will, when so many energy efficiency projects get, get cut off at the knees. Um, make, make sure we're looking at the long-term costs and benefits of these types of systems. All right, so that was a, a, a simulation. Let's look at a real building. Uh, for this particular uh, site, uh, this was once again out of a, a NIA pilot project. They found about an $8 per square foot premium and savings of 115,000 115, kilowatt hours per year. Uh, and their return on investment was about eight years. So pretty similar to that, that Boise example. What this actually looked like in practice uh, from converting from a, a baseline system to um, a, a high efficiency heat exchanger, uh, this was one of the, the old, one of three old RTUs that was getting lifted off the building. Uh, and these were then replaced with uh, five uh, BRF outdoor units. And there's your high efficiency heat exchanger. Uh, so the, the HRVs on this particular project, they, they didn't necessarily use as many as they should have. You, re you really wanna make sure that you're hitting all your ventilation requirements um, to deliver that you know, ASHRAE 62.1 standard. Another standard that we have here at our lab that you can check out, ideally, I mean, Hopefully you, you all have this in your offices, but if you don't, please, please do. Um, and, you know, the, the great thing about this is um, not only are, are you making a, a cleaner roof entry, um, you know, there's, there's less area for leaks. Um, it's, it's limiting the, the load on the roof as well. Uh, so fewer weight requirements um, structurally required within the building to keep these up. Uh, this is showing kind of ideally how, how it should be. Um, you want to connect through the roof, your HRV, with the shortest duct 
and, and curb as possible. So um, not having kind of those long uh, insulated duct lines kind of running around on your roof with a lot of um, bends in there. Uh, make sure you're, you're getting the maximum flow and, and as efficient a flow as possible out of your HRV so it can, um, you know, you, you're not overusing your fan energy. One of the new tools we just got, I mean, we've had it for a while, but we just got a, a newer digital, much nicer version, easier to use. I'm so happy with it, um, is a flow hood. Uh, if you are uh, working on site and you want to check that your registers are actually supplying the CFM to the spaces as you designed, um, that's a, it's a great tool to do that um, and, and great for commissioning as well as, um, you know, checking to see if the, the existing building is, is meeting ASHRAE 62.1 standards um, or if certain zones are being overventilated. So free, free tool to check out. Um, yeah, re reach out to us if you need it. So um, what, what we're really doing is, is transferring, you know, a, a lot of this equipment that was up on the roof. You know, we, we still have some rooftop equipment for our, our VRF compressors, but, but a whole lot less. And we're now kind of moving that indoors. Uh, so we've got VRF terminal units or, or other air source heat pumps kind of within the system, within the building envelope itself. Um, you could also look at using a ground source heat pump to, to really maximize efficiency. Well, that also has a, a capital cost or a hydronic, like a, a radiant system or say a, a four pipe fan coil. Um, especially if you can use a heat pump plant to, to really maximize those coefficients of performance and get away using the uh, least amount of electricity, least amount of energy as possible. All right, so this is kind of a, a look at the, the guts of what's going up on the roof and then um, what's gonna be going on you know, inside the building. So fewer structural requirements on, on the roof would be great. In terms of design considerations, we do have to account for humidity uh, I'm looking at time, um, so I, I might not be able to dive into this as, as deeply as it deserves. Uh, there's, there's another great ASHRAE standard out there, Humidity Control Design Guide for commercial and institutional buildings. Summers are less concerning in Boise, um, but as we're designing tighter and tighter buildings, especially if you're looking at a passive house standard, uh, which has very strict envelope requirements, even locally, you know, um, uh, our, our, our 2018 energy code update is, is looking at stricter requirements. Um, you you, you want to make sure that you're not, you know, growing all sorts, sorts of mold and, and nasties uh, during the winter by um, not being able to, to remove the, the, the latent load within the space from everybody breathing and whatever might be happening within, you know, shower rooms or things like that. Um, there's also an online tool that Ventacity has uh, in terms of a selector to see if you need strictly HRV, you know, only sensible, or if uh, an energy recovery ventilator is, is needed for that. Um, but I'm going to keep moving on for now. So some other HRV design considerations. Uh, really make sure that it is the system is is capable of doing demand controlled ventilation, so CO2 monitors within the space or occupancy counts, so that you're not ventilating an empty room. Right now, we might be doing that because of COVID. Um, in the future, we probably don't want to be doing that as much because it costs so much energy, and we want to be able to vary the volume of air, variable air volume, depending on the individual space um, and the loads within that. And of course, having that conmizer bypass. Um, in terms of other controls with the, the heat pumps that might be in there or other terminal equipment, some of those struggle with, um, well not struggle, they just have longer startup times. Uh, so it's, it's really key to account for those. Um, there's some Idaho power incentives on making sure that you've got proper startup and shutdown sequences for that equipment, so check out their website for that. Uh, also make sure that you're managing for airflow direction. Uh, Boise is a primarily heating dominated climate and especially when we're looking at cold climate air source heat pumps. Um, if we have all of our terminal units up on the, 
ceiling uh, or, or where the wall meets the ceiling, as you would typically see some of those cassette units, it can be a struggle to get that warm air down into the space. And um, especially if you've got your HRV set up so that you're um, dropping, you know, that, that cooler air, that outdoor air within the space, you might get some stratification that you, that you really struggle with. So if possible um, for comfort, uh, see if you can use kind of low baseboard or at least like windowsill height for some of your terminal equipment in a heating dominated climate. That might not be the case for every client, um, but something to keep in mind. Other considerations is uh, these aren't super well equipped to handle, uh, say a gym, an auditorium, uh, or a, a restaurant, any place with a, a very high flow area. Um, the, the capacities for these high efficiency systems are still relatively low in terms of their maximum CFM. So you might need multiple units, uh, especially in say a, a multifamily or multi-story building. Um, it, it's not that, um, you know, they're, they're ineffective. It's just that uh, you, you need to make sure that you are still providing the ASHRAE 62.1 amount of fresh air. Um, and of course, the higher the CFM, the, the harder it is for these units to maintain that, that high efficiency mode. All right, so some final thoughts. Um, HRV systems are, are great. We just need to make sure that they're high efficiency and we're designing them in that way from the very beginning so that we can maximize our savings by minimizing terminal unit equipment. Also convey to your clients the, the qualitative improvements that can be made, you know, from dedicated outdoor air. Health is on everybody's mind right now with COVID, but also smell, not, not recirculating odors within the space, but exhausting, you know, directly from trash or restroom areas noise, minimizing the amount of airflow um, that's that's rattling around in ducts that's used for conditioning versus the fresh air that we just need. And then, you know, future proofing for future pandemics, future things that might come up. Uh, I think it's important to note that the well standard out there, um, uh, you know, passive house requires uh, ASHRAE 62.1 even code, I think 62.1 is probably going to get an update. They're probably going to push up the requirements. So something to, to consider um, if, if you have kind of a larger capacity unit, but you're operating it in a more efficient range, that might be something to consider in terms of future proofing. Um, thank you for your time today. I, I do want to note that, you know, a lot of this is coming from um, wiser, older people than myself. Uh, so please refer to the ASHRAE design guide for dedicated outdoor air systems. Look at betterbricks.com and their very high efficiency dedicated outside air system design guide. It's, it's wonderful. If you want more on the economics, look at the red car analytics report. Energy Trust of Oregon also has a, a presentation on file from Barry Stevens over at, um, and it, it, it's, it's a, a much more detailed training, multi-hour. Uh, that goes into these high efficiency systems. But hopefully this provided uh, somewhat of, a, of a, a good overview or update for engineers as well as architects. Um, and with that, I think that's, that's my time. So uh, feel free to email me if you've got questions or comments. And uh, I'll Damon? look at the chat. Yeah. Uh, one question from the chat uh, from Richard. Uh, he would like to know what CFMs um, are you using on the site charts? Oh, Richard, that is a good question. Um, you know, I would have to look back at my notes to see exactly what I was putting in there. Um, I, th I think I was looking at a thousand CFM, um, but I can get back to you and let you know. I'm just making a note to do that. Uh, also, um, I'd be remiss if I forgot that Dylan, um, is there a poll going out um, on evaluation? There yes. it is. Okay. Um, so please let us know um, how how this presentation was for you, and let us know if there are other topics specifically you would love to see us cover in the future. We're 
as, as much as I love being in the ivory tower and the academic world, we want to make sure that this is relevant to uh, your industry and your needs. Uh, so if there's something that you feel is not getting enough coverage or you're only getting marketing material on it and you want some third party verification, um, feel free to, to reach out to us and, and let us know what would be helpful. So our topics are kind of set for this year, but uh, we'll, we're always looking for new ones for next year. And um, don't see other questions in the chat. Feel free to also unmute yourselves and just ask directly as well. I'll stay on for another couple of awkward Zoom minutes. Another question. I think these systems are kind of on, on everyone's minds right now um, with, with COVID, but I'm, I'm really thrilled to see more adoption and using basic engineering principles to uh, recycle heat um, as directly as possible. Uh, hello, Damon. This is uh, Jeff Rigotti from NIA. Uh, I mean, we may may have never met, but uh, I just wanted to say the presentation was excellent. Thank you for going through it, and you know you did did a did a fantastic job on presenting our um, VA very high efficiency DOAS program. I just wanted to give one plug, and that is that uh, here in the first quarter at the end of March, on on that uh, document that you referenced, we're going to have an updated list of all of the. Uh, manufacturers and their products that meet our requirements. And we're going to have some additions already beyond Ventacity. We have the Swag on Wheel on there, uh, the Gold RX, but we'll also be adding some, uh, at least one other manufacturer in their, in their product. So uh, we're seeing more, more and more interest in this, especially with the Washington Code stuff going on and more manufacturers, you know, developing products that will meet our requirements. So, so good news there. That's great. Yeah, I'm glad to hear more products are, are entering the market. So thank you, Jeff. Appreciate yeah, it. Yeah, you bet. Thank you for going through this.